journalist Mumia Abu Jamal is currently serving a life sentence in Pennsylvania for murder of a police officer. Charges his supporters say were fabricated because of his political acts. According to his wife, Mumia is currently in dire health and not receiving proper medical care. In this exclusive excerpt from the book Octavia's Brood, Mumia Abu Jamal discusses Star Trek, Star Wars, and U.S. Empire. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. When Star Wars premiered in 1977, it swept the nation like a fever. Lines circled blocks, and before long, it was more than a movie. It was a craze. TV commercials hawked wares and blazoned with Star Wars figures available from McDonald's. Get yours now. Before all was said and done, the movie grossed nearly half a billion dollars. That's billions with a B. I was, however, out of the loop. In 1977, I was in my 23rd year of life, and the targeted demographic was pre-teen and teen rather than post-teen. Besides, I was more of a Star Trek guy, and it didn't hurt that one of the stars of the Trekkie universe was a black beauty who blazed the screen like a dark, luscious comet every time she appeared. To the uninitiated, I here refer to actress Michelle Nichols, who performed as Lieutenant Uhura, of the Trek bridge crew. That said, I watched with fascination as the lines grew and other film companies tried to copy the money-making magic of the Star Wars franchise. They usually failed miserably, however. Why did Star Wars strike such a deep and jangling nerve? Why did it become a craze? One would seem to surprise everyone, critics, the movie's executives, all it seemed except producer George Lucas. The nation had just recently been forced to submit to a seemingly uncivilized, as in low-tech enemy, and it faced the generational rebellion of the 60s. The Vietnam syndrome permeated the culture, not just the political elites. The younger were virtually uniformly anti-war in their orientation, and a counterculture was sweeping the nation, changing dress, hairstyles, sexual mores, food consumption, and the way national minorities both were perceived and perceive themselves. In short, the land was in the midst of a cultural and political rebellion sparked in large part by resistance to an unpopular war. An American president, Nixon, recently resigned several months after his vice president, top aides, including the attorney general, John Mitchell, were sent to prison. The human detritus of what would become the Watergate scandal. In this context, why would a movie, even one set in another world, find appeal when the heroes were the ragtag bunch of rebels, decidedly low-tech, fighting against a fearsome, militarily invincible empire? Part of Star Wars' success was its undeniable youth appeal, yet there must be deeper reasons for its cultural resonance. America, the empire, didn't like its role, at least among the young. It wanted to reimagine itself as the ragtag band, fighting against great odds, against an evil empire. It imagined itself as it wanted to be, as it claimed to be in its infancy against a cruel and despotic king of the late 18th century. It reshaped itself into the rebels, not the imperial overlords. It shaped itself as oppressed, fighting for freedom. But America, like every nation, has its ages of psychosis. It has fits of indecision and periods of self-delusion. Consider how American presidents spoke movingly of freedom from tyranny while holding personally hundreds of men, women, and children in slavery. Or imagine Jefferson, the sage of Monticello, who was the father of half black children at the same moment as he wrote in his only book, Notes on the State of Virginia, that black people were essentially non-human, a species related to the orangutan. I mean, does this mean that he saw himself as being in the bestiality? Or did this mean he really thought his children were, well, half monkey? Americans, like any people, are subject to delusions. Was this fascination with Star Wars and the national identification with the rebels one of them? For generations, Americans have declined to define themselves as imperialists. That's what our enemies called us. That wasn't what we called ourselves. We were for freedom. 
We were for self-determination. We were good. We were white, mostly. We were Luke Skywalker, not Darth Vader, and definitely not the cruel, warped Emperor. Yet aficionados of the Star Wars saga know that Luke and Darth were, after all, intimately related. Darth's infamous line at their lightsaber battle has become a cultural byword, I am your father, Luke. It is a measure of Lucas's genius that he scripts that moment of self-realization, of self-discovery, and of revelation. In the grisly aftermath of a war that tore millions from the face of Asia, all to cover for the corporate exploitation of Vietnam's bauxite and other natural resources, the Imperial shock trooper, the Imperial metallic death's hand, was father to the rebel. They were, in fact, more than related. In truth, they were one. That is the meaning of Star Wars. We were rebels. We are Empire. And like all rebellious children, we were but going through a phase. We're getting ready for adulthood after we sowed a few wild oats. Once grown, we put on our Imperial uniform and bow to the Empire. It is your destiny, right? Unless... From somewhere, maybe on the Enterprise, this is Mumia Abu-Jamal. These commentaries are recorded by Noel Hanrahan of Prison Radio.